Is this the calm before the storm? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me to talk about the macro picture is Mike Kulba, founder and chief investment officer of Strom Capital Management. And for a look at some trading strategies we need to be thinking about is Dave Floyd, founder of Aspen Trading. Hi to both of you. Hey, Maggie. How's it going? Hey, Dave. It's it's going well, thanks. I love when we have two uh, experts on with us. Uh, we can really kind of jump in, especially on a Monday. So, Mike, let's set the scene, the sort of macro scene first with you, if we if we could. U.S. stocks rallied early today, but we saw that fade toward the close, especially the Nasdaq. I think it's going to end up in negative territory. U.S. Treasury yield hovering around that 4%, but it feels like everyone's kind of waiting for something to happen or waiting for some sort of breakout. How are you thinking about these markets? Yeah, you know, honestly, I think we're just sort of in this confusion stage. I mean, there's been back and forth, you know, one of my favorite follows there is Brent Donnelly, and he wrote something the other day where he talked about, you know, so far this year, we've already gone through almost four different narrative changes in the first two months. And so, you know, I feel like everyone is just sort of racing to the opposite side of the boat, trying to figure it out. And it's kind of just this churn, just frustrating everyone. Yeah, I think that's a great, I love the boat, the the boat, uh, you know, visual, because I think that's so right. I mean, it, everyone is kind of whipping around and it's been really hard to find a trend or to figure out how to position for this. Uh, so we, you know, we're keeping an eye on a whole bunch of events. One of them today that was making headlines, China, pretty conservative with its growth forecast. Are investors kind of rethinking some of the uh, bullishness around China reopening, what that might do to both the global economy, also maybe commodities. What's happening on that front? So what I actually thought was pretty interesting in today's action is if you look at what suffered the most, I mean, it was really the Russell 2000 that just was steadily sold all day long. And some people will look at that as sort of, you know, like your cyclical indicator. Um, but then if you look at emerging markets, even Chinese equities in particular, you look at oil and copper, some of the things that you would sort of expect to trade together with sort of the China stimulus, you know, flood-like stimulus, as they like to say, they, none of those were saying the same thing as the pain in the Russell. And so mm -hmm. to me, I don't know, it kind of felt like, you know, there's just sort of a knee-jerk reaction, whereas, you know, maybe it wasn't sort of that huge you know, big unwind that that we should uh, be looking at. Um, with that said, you know, there is a chart that, you know, I'd love to pull up because it does speak to sort of that China stimulus and sort of, you know, one of the things that I've been looking at lately is the um, China credit impulse. And so I pull up on my screen here. And if we look at this, we can kind of see how the Chinese credit impulse actually tends to lead other economic indicators like Japan machine tool orders. Um, and so, you know, that is the Chinese credit impulse is starting to roll over a little bit. But if you look back at the past couple of cycles, that tends to happen. But you kind of get that continuation of sort of that cyclical impulse. Um, and why that's so interesting to me is, you know, if I come back to the machine tool orders, here's another one versus the Nikkei you kind of see how the Nikkei tracks the tool orders, in fact, somewhat leads it a bit. And so recently, you know, here's one more, I'll pull up this potential breakout in the Nikkei index. And so it does have me thinking of, you know, is this sort of already in motion that there is some juices flowing through the system and, you know, whether or not China resorts to that flood-like stimulus, if that's what you want to call it. Um, I don't know. I mean, today just felt like too much of a knee-jerk reaction to me. Yeah, it's 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 going to be something interesting. We also have to watch what they do versus what they say too. That's another, you know, that's another a, a big issue always with China. Um, you mentioned the Nikkei there, so we have a lot. We have a lot going on that we do have to be paying attention to this week. We've got Fed Chair Powell testifying. We have monthly jobs report out Friday. We know that you know we've been getting whipped around on inflation data, but we have a question. Uh, from Chile next, do you have a view on the BOJ meeting on Friday? Any changes in yield curve policy expected? So a lot of potential headline risk out there. Are you watching for the BOJ? How, how important will that be for you, Mike? So I am keeping an eye there, but I don't really have any expectations going into it. Um, you know, personally, I mean, if you're looking for a situation to go long the yen, 
with that risk of them sort of lifting their curve target or you know, whatever the adjustments they might make. Um, I mean, you, you have a pretty attractive, at least to me, technical setup to, you know, potentially short USD JPY here. So, um, you know, I'll be watching it, but, you know, I don't have any sort of firm expectations, you know, heading into the meeting itself. So we, you know, we're, we're going to be watching currencies there. I know that certainly equity investors, I think, are really going to be focused on the Fed, given the history now that we have. And we're really looking for that confirmation in the February data. Do we see another, you know, upside surprise in anything? Uh I don't know if they're going to get, you know, we've sort of seen the most severe reactions. Everyone's now expecting it. So maybe we won't see the same kind of react. But, um, you know, given that what's been playing out on the rate front, many have been bearish tech. It was interesting to see Apple and tech lead early, but then it kind of faded into the close. I'm bringing this up because Rao, we we're kicking off a big two week series. Rao has the first installment of that out. And he makes a case that tech is going to be the place to continue to invest. Let's have a listen and we'll talk on the other side. I'm trying. The easiest way to show this to you is here's the chart, the log trend of the NASDAQ. Beautiful uptrend. Here we are, two standard deviations oversold. So usually when you hit something like this, you're looking to accumulate here because the next phase is the continuation of the trend. You can try and argue with me that, well, technology, it's overvalued and it's there's inflation forever and it's going to stay low and it's going to collapse. Maybe, maybe some of that, maybe none of that. Maybe the relentless force and speed of this means you don't have any choice in a low growth world, but to invest in growth itself. And it doesn't almost matter how overvalued they are. And that overvalued relationship, I think people are misunderstanding too but I have a very different thesis on this. So you can choose to avoid it and say it's expensive, it's gonna trade sideways, it's gonna trade down. You know, we got another 10 years, this is 2001 all over again. Well, if you bought technology at the low in 2001, you did very well, at uh, 2002, you did very well indeed. We've had the fault. Most of this stuff, the exponential stuff, is down 75, 80% to the low and it's bouncing. Some of these things are up 100% this year alone. And that's just the start of where this is going. So we can have CHOP, we can have complications with interest rates, but really, cost of capital, 5%, 6%, 4% makes no difference to things growing at 100% a year. Something that goes from zero users to 100 million users in a month doesn't give a shit about your cost of capital. It also doesn't care about your rate of inflation. It doesn't care about your opinions either. It just happens. And that is a staggering, staggering realization that you have to deal with. It's like, okay, this is all going on regardless of all of the macro doom and gloom, of all of the doom porn that's spread on Twitter all day. And they might be right, but technology is still going higher. Just get your entry point. I think the entry point is here. You can hear that full interview on our website. It's the kickoff to the new series we're doing. We're going to look at some of the biggest challenges facing us in the first week and then take a dive into some of the opportunities that exist in the second week. Scan the QR code and become a member for that. It's going to be juicy stuff, as you can tell from the title. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Mike Hugo wrote tech, question mark, question mark, question mark. I mean, Raul's saying, listen, I mean, this, and if you know, Raul has been his long held theory and he's long term going to say that right now long term but saying we, we can have chop we can have complications with rate doesn't matter this is this is what's happening certainly not a consensus call i think it's fair to say yeah you know i it's certainly not one that you're hearing a lot of these days um but the one thing that i would like to suggest and it's you know i've been racking my brain a lot lately because everyone's saying you know the, re the equity resilience makes no sense i mean you look at the backup in rates and equities have kind of just been grinding higher. And so I've been doing a lot of poking around. And one theory that I would like to throw out there, and it kind of does support Raul's case, even for tech, is that there are some market pricing indicators, at least to me, that suggest that the market might believe that the Fed is making a mistake of pausing too early. And so, you know, I'll, I'll throw up another quick chart here. And share this and uh so basically what this is, is the real one-year rate so it's your nominal interest rate minus 
uh, inflation, one year inflation expectations. And what we've seen is since really January is that continues to fall, right? Real rates falling, and that's generally supportive of equity valuations. Now, a lot of people will look at the five year and 10 year, and those have been kind of sideways for this year so far, but the one year has been declining. And so to me, what that really suggests is that the market is part, you know, arguably in the belief that the Fed might be easy or stepping off the brakes too soon. And so, you know, if you just think in terms of the relative attractiveness in an inflationary environment, equities are still a better choice than bonds, right? Because equities at least have some pricing power, their earnings and, and revenues can go up with inflation, whereas bonds are just fixed payments. And so, you know, it, as far as supporting Raul's argument, short term, possibly, but you know, I, I, I don't have a long term view. <laughs> <laughs> Mike says diplomatically. <laughs> uh, so what, what is there anything that you like here? And we're, I'm going to talk to Dave about a little bit about this, too, because what we've been hearing relentlessly is cash is not trash. Cash is the only place to be right now. Um, so that's kind of a given. But is there anything else that looks attractive to you in this sort of murky, complicated market, Mike? Yeah, so I'm actually spending a lot of time on foreign equities. I mean, I mentioned Japan, and there's a lot of attractive charts out there to me. But even in Europe, I mean, there is an argument for sort of the luxury goods because of Chinese sort of trying to bolster consumption. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to me, I mean, I look at data like the UK construction PMIs today were very strong. I mean, I think they came in at 54.6, if I recall correctly. Um, way above expectations. And that's, you know, that's a region that has been labeled as, you know, the central bank was reluctantly hiking rates, you know, into an economic slowdown. And so that's a huge surprise. And I look at a lot of these different, you know, industrial machinery type names in, you know, both Europe and even Japan. And I mean, they're just trading at significant discounts to their own historical multiples. And so, you know, I think there are definitely opportunities to be had on the long side if you're going to look underneath the surface. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, we were thinking about uh, Rob really wanted to do this series, I think, because of all of the sort of uh, concerns looming and doom. I'm just looking through when I asked you what you like. I'm looking through our chat and I'm seeing beef, water. I mean, there's a reason we're doing um, how to unfuck your future and focusing on the sort of scary scenarios in the first week, because it is that people feel like that. There's so much uncertainty about what's going to happen with these central banks and all the talk of sovereign risk that it's it's understandable that people are trying to sort of navigate a way through this. Um, but yeah, interesting I mean, to one... hear you talk about some of the some of the emerging and international opportunities, Mike, because it used to be Tina, right? Everyone just flooding into U.S. equities, but a lot of talk that it's a different environment now. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think the question that I would pose, and I'd love to hear responses is, you know, we keep hearing this argument that the economy just does not work at 4%, 5% rates. And sort of my question is, what's the empirical evidence behind that? Um, you know, do we know that it can't work at 5% rates? I mean, if growth is strong enough, that's a possibility. I mean, there's certainly a shock aspect when you have such an abrupt backup in rates. I mean, we know that. But, you know, I, I think once you sort of get past that shock effect, then is there a sort of normalization period where people are just like, you know, what? OK, I mean, a couple weeks ago, I was at 7% mortgage rates. If I could get, you know, 6% now, maybe I'll take the plunge. And so, you know, I think it was Jimmy Jude, who's a popular Twitter account out there. He posted and I and I had to laugh because I, I think I tend to agree with him is the most popular common out there now is cash is no longer trash. And the most obvious decision is to pile into short term rates where you can get an attractive yield. And so in the twisted mind of the market, which it loves to do, the thing that could really punish people most is just kind of keep going up while everyone's like, no, oh, I'm going to you know, sit in my cash. And so I, I just, uh, I don't know. I mean, to me, I, I keep an eye on the trends and the data. Mm. And I think things are, are resilient, but at the end of the day, I mean, I, I have to respect the price action, at least beneath the surface, it still looks, it still looks okay to me. Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, you know, if everyone's, uh, you got uh, Oliver's attention, who was just talking about bonds, as a matter of fact, in the chat. So um, if everyone's saying that cash is the place to be, you know, does that create a risk, especially for all the traders out there? I know it gets their spidey sense up. 
Um, fantastic stuff. Uh, Mike and I, of course, are going to continue talking about the conversation and along. We want to hear your comments. We want to hear your questions about the series too, because as you know, Mike does a lot of the, we got the messages. So if something doesn't sit with you, if you want more explanation, if you want sort of a, a deeper dive into some of this and what it means, um, send them our way. We'll grab them all and the team will tackle them because there's going to be a lot of interesting questions raised. And as you can tell, Raul set us up, but not everybody agrees with them. And so we're going to hear all different sides, especially when it comes to the problems facing us. Uh, and and the sort of big time bombs, if you will, that loom, and then where are their opportunities? We're going to talk about some of them. Maybe there are others that you're interested in or you want to hear. So make sure that you uh, send us your questions and comments, and Mike will tackle them. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Maggie. Always good to see you. So let's bring in Dave now, who's been listening to this whole conversation. And Dave, really curious to get your thoughts about this, because I think I love Mike's sort of image of a, everyone running from one side of the boat to the other, because it does kind of feel like that. It's a tough market. Yeah, thanks for having me, Maggie. Um, it is a challenging market, and I think part of the reason it's challenging is that it's a very different market environment than what most, not everybody, but what most people have become, uh, become accustomed to for the last 5, 10, even 15 years, which is very directional type markets. Yeah. Uh, and directional in that phase was clearly up. Um, we're not in that any longer. We're very choppy. We're back and forth. We have very different very different macro environment unfolding than we did for the last 5, 10, 15 years. So yeah, I mean, the the way to play the game has dramatically changed as it always does at some point in the market. And unless you've you know been around for a long time or have that flexibility and adaptive kind of personality, you know, what you were doing before likely is not working and it's really frustrating. Yeah, I think that's a really great way to put it. And I think we're in that transition phase where it feels really uncomfortable. I love talking about the fact that in that environment where there are different options and alternatives, there's going to be opportunity. Um, and so we're going to continue to lean into that as the year goes on. W what are some of the things we've heard this? It's not like it was before. We're not sure what it is, but it's not like it was before. We got to get rid of the old habits. Uh, I think that buy the dip falls into that for you, doesn't it? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, first of all, it was never a viable trading strategy to begin with. I mean, yes, it worked, uh, don't get me wrong, but I think it probably led a lo lot of people down uh, a false path. It works when the Federal Reserve is providing very easy mon monetary conditions, um, it works. Uh, but buying the dip basically is, you know, you're, you're adding to your risk on every, on every dip. And at some point when you're adding to your risk, the prices keep going lower and that's what we're seeing now. Um, whereas before you always got rewarded for that. And again, buy the dip, of course, works on occasion. I mean, I buy pullbacks a lot, but again, you have to understand the context of within which you're doing it. You know, just blindly buying the dips, which is the strategy I'm referring to and strategy I say in quotes, that's not really a strategy. Um, you have to be very tactical about your trades and that's where people are really gonna have to kind of really up their game. Um, you know, trading is not, not an easy thing. And, I, and I'm approaching this from a trading perspective, not an investing perspective. Um, markets are always changing. You have to be aware of what they're doing. And, and my belief is that price action should dictate what you're doing and kind of leave the macros aside because the macro argument doesn't usually factor in when you're, when you're a trader because your, your, your time frames are much shorter. And yes, that's an undergoing underlying current that's not going to drive drive your trade home, you know, unless you, you know, versus someone who has a time frame of one to two years. You know, for me, it's a several days or a week or two. The macro environment may or may not have much of an impact on my trade. I have to rely more on technicals and price action. Mm. What are you what are you looking at when it comes to the S&P 500? Because there's been a lot of technical conversation. It's it's near its 200 day moving average. It's kind of at important technical levels. Is it going to hold? Is it what, what are what are you looking at when it comes to the S&P 500 these days, given that what you just said? To be honest, when I, I'm not skirting the question. It, it's day to day. You know, I evaluate what's happening on a day to day basis. And I had a nice rally on Friday, which you could easily say, hey, we were long overdue for that. Now it's a question for me, what do I do with this rally? You know, do I wait to buy a pullback? Is this simply a, a little bit of a correction higher that's eventually going to resume in, in the dominant trend right now, which is basically to the downside from the February highs? So there's not, there's not an easy answer. It's kind of dipping your toe in the water and finding out what's working and watching 
in the marketplace to find out what's working. And I always go back to price levels. Where's the market getting hung up? You know, where are we finding stickiness? And then how do we react from those levels? That's the only thing I can do that gives me a sense of where the market, by and large, wants to go. So for me, I, I'm basically approaching it on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Um, I've never been in the business of you know longer term forecasts, and I think right now that's even more challenging if you're trying to do that. Mm. Has your uh, the duration of your trades gotten even shorter? I mean, you're short term anyway, but has they have they gotten even shorter given all the uncertainty out there? Absolutely, absolutely, and it, and it's not because of the uncertainty, although I guess that would be the d- driver of why that is, but the fact that we just can't get the market to move in a sustained direction for a very long period of time. So the, the, the shortness in the duration of my trades is really more a function of trade management. You know, I'm taking, what, I'm taking as much as I can from what the market's giving me, but we're not getting these long bursts up or long bursts down. So, down, so that, ends up being, uh, that ends up reducing your trade duration. I'm not doing it because I want to trade mm-hmm. shorter in terms of the duration. I'm just basically sitting there going, the market's not going to give me any more right here. I'm out. On to the next yeah, trade. It's interesting. I mean, how do you adjust? Is it possible or how do you how do you find the sort of indicators that you look at and the kinds of triggers you want to tell you I want to get in and I get out if we're grinding sideways? Do you have to use a different yeah. set of tools for that, Dave? Well, in a sideways market, it's really tough. I mean, for most people, myself included, a sideways a sideways market's really challenging. You like, for instance, all of last week until Friday or late Thursday into Friday, I really didn't do anything. We were just kind of grinding sideways with a slight downside bias. I'll be honest, there's nothing to do in there. And if anybody's telling you they were making hay in there, I don't know, probably not, probably a little bit of a tall tale. So in those markets, you can't really do anything. So it's a waiting game. And again, that's where a lot of traders get hung up too. They can't be patient enough. Just because the market's open doesn't mean there's an opportunity. You've got to pick your spots and you've got to have faith in, in what you've done historically in terms of your approach and your, your, um, your system, so to speak, to approaching the market. So sometimes you have to wait for the market to kind of break in a particular direction. You're, you're going to miss those breaks, unfortunately, but you know none of us are clairvoyant enough to know when a bottom is in or a top is in. But then what you the important thing to do after is evaluate it. Are those gains being held? And I'm referring to, let's say, Friday's big move up. Well, by and large, we held on to those gains. We topped out at around 4070. Today, we're at 4054. So I would say, by and large, we did not give anything back that we saw on Friday. So that's very encouraging. The question you have to ask yourself is, is this the start of something a little bit more sustained? And the answer is, is unclear. But I would still caution that the trend off of February 2nd, which is the last swing high we've had, is still down. So yeah, I'll play this to the upside, but I'm well aware that I'm fighting the overall trend and that we, we could just as easily reverse lower. And going into Friday with the jobs report, those are the exact types of days where you get those you know, reversals. You, know, you get a snap reversal because the market reacts to the data in a way that is pretty violent at times. And violence, not the right word, but you know, extreme. Yeah. I mean, the price action just reacts immediately. So I think that goes back and addresses your question. Yeah. I can't give like a canned answer of, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, that will work out. It's really a question of, do you have a viable trading strategy and are you uh, applying it, you know, religiously? And are you also just as importantly, not applying it when there's really no opportunity? And that's it. That, that, the idea of doing nothing is challenging for, you know. Very yeah. challenging for most. Uh, is there yeah. is it is the setup very similar? Are you looking at similar market conditions when you're talking about currencies as well? Because I know that you're you're active in that space. Uh, the U.S. dollar. Yeah. A lot of people have been wondering about that as well. Yeah, you know the thing I learned a long time ago is that if one market is struggling in terms of it, you know, finding direction, and uh, you know, assuming it's a large market, you know, if you're talking, let's say, you know, about some small, you know. Uh, niche market, that's very different. But, you know, something like the S&Ps, I think it's safe to say they're struggling in here. You know, it's a lot of chop back and forth. When that's happening, every other market's in the same boat. Uh, Ten-year notes are at an inflection point. Did we put in a low last Friday? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I don't know. Currency is the same thing. Is the dollar about to roll over? Looks like it. But again, will that be short-lived? And therefore, if the dollar's rolling over, the euro is going to go higher. 
So yeah, once, you know, if one market's kind of funky, you're not going to go into greener pastures somewhere else. They're usually all pretty funky because they're all interrelated on something. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you talk about trade metrics being very important right now. What do you mean by that? Well, they're always important, but you know, when you get into a market like this and trade metrics, let me just define what I'm talking about. You know, generally speaking, we always talk about, hey, what, what's your total return? How much did you make on the trade? And those are all wonderful things. I mean, if, if you know, because if you're making good trades, you're making money, that's fantastic. But in a market like this, where, you know, winning trades and sustained winning trades are harder to come by, you need to know, you know, what your underlying trade metrics are. And trade metrics are nothing more than taking your trade data and then analyzing it, usually through software and, and whatnot to find out really how robust your strategy is. You know, you could, you could make $100,000, let's say on a trade or over a period of a few months, but underlying that masks a real risk to your approach because you're taking a ton of risk to make some money, but that's hidden if you're just looking at gross P&L. So, you know, trade metrics are the way that a sophisticated investor, a sophisticated trader is gonna look at a series of trades and go, nice returns, but wow, there's a hidden risk right there because of the way you achieve those, uh, the way you achieve those gains. So, you know, obvious red flags, high sharp ratios. Um, that usually indicates that you know to get a high sharp ratio, you're usually piling into very crowded trades, and eventually those trades get too crowded and they go the other way, and then you you incrementally make money on the way up like a roller coaster, and then you lose a, a big chunk of money real quick. So. Kind of knowing what your underlying trade metrics are is really important. And I'll give you a couple others. And this is a whole, you know, topic in and of itself. And but it's so important. You know, you should be looking at your metrics from the standpoint of, am I making money when the market's having an up day? And am I making money when the market's having a down day? And this is more from a trader's perspective. Investors don't have that ability to do that because they're investors. You know, they're willing to sit through that. But one of the things I do that I measure all the time is that if the market's up 1% or down 1% or more, and I'm talking about the S&P 500, I want to measure what my day was relative to that. And what I'm shooting for, and I think what all traders should shoot for, is what they call positive convexity. Are you making money when the market's up? But more importantly, are you making money when the markets are down? And if the answer is yes, guess what? You have a robust trading strategy. Now, maybe it's not the one that shoots the lights out, but at the end of the day, when markets become difficult or let's say they're biased to the downside, people aren't concerned about making outsized returns. They're about protecting their capital and maybe just making inter incremental gains. That's when, pers that's when a, a, an investor or trader's true you know, nature comes out. You know, it's easy to be all excited when the market's trending straight up. How much can you make? And I get that. But in a market like this, it's about grinding it out and you're not going to know if the, your approach is really valid or, you know, able to hold up to the scrutiny that the market's giving you right now. So I know that's a very long no, it's, answer. No, it's really important. This is really yeah, important stuff. In my I think it is really important stuff. And maybe now more than ever, uh, you know, now that we're away from that period um, that was really distorted because of QE. Um, for anyone who is mm -hmm. looking to sort of, um, if you're not a trader already and just looking to increase your um, ability awareness uh, and and improve your build some trading strategies. Um, we've got a whole uh, section from Dave on the Academy on the website, which is so worth your time looking at. And we're going to be doing a festival of learning at the end of the month um, that covers a lot of stuff. But part of it is also how do you actually execute? How do you you know, develop trading strategies? How do you know what to look for? All the kinds of things that Dave's talking about, which are really going to be important. We hear from so many people, dispersion. This is a different environment. Um, you're really going to need a sort of different toolbox, I think, for this, Dave, now. How, how um, when you look back at, for as long as you've been doing this, I think there's a sense that this is a really temporary situation, this sideways, you know, uh, moment we're in and we're going to get some clarity. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? Maybe not. I mean, again, this gets a little bit beyond what I look at on a day-to-day -day basis, but I hear your question loud and clear. I think there's two answers to that. I think there's a whole camp of people that are looking for a return to the to the um, you know the really juicy days that we've seen over the last five to ten years. In my personal opinion, I think that's gone for a period of time because 
interest rates are probably going to be stickier to the upside than most people um, expect. Um, it, 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 even if they do start coming down, like Mike was talking earlier, there's been a nasty shock to the upside in terms of interest rates. And the market's going to trade differently based on that. Now you have choices. Am I better off in cash? Am I better off in you know, earning four, over 4%? You know, on ten-year notes versus putting it into equities, those those weren't logic or those weren't options available to investors and traders. You know, just two years ago, there was only one option, and everybody piled into stocks. Um, so that's one way to look at it. Um, but will this period of consolidation be brief? Yeah, probably. The the, the big question though is, are we going to break higher or lower? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, you know, if I'm using just February second the February 2nd high as my most recent kind of anchor point, I would expect prices to move lower because we've trended lower. Now we're consolidating and I would expect us to break lower. But again, that's just my yeah. guess. I'll know more on a day-to-day -day basis as I look at how the market's reacting to certain news events, to certain price levels. The market leaves you plenty of clues. You just have to be patient enough to look at, you know, look for them and that goes back to a point that you and I have talked about and I've talked about on Real Vision for as long as I've been here, which is, you know, five plus years, is know the market you trade. Only trade a handful of markets because you have to be intimately familiar with them. If not, you miss all the really good stuff that it gives you on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a, that, and, that, and that is a great piece of advice every time you hear it because it's very tempting, especially if you don't know what's happening somewhere, to sort of, you know, run to the next shiny object. So. Dave. Absolutely. Yeah. With no, squirrel, no squirrel syndrome. <laughs> That's right. Dave, so much wisdom in there. Thank you so much. It's always good to kind of get that reset when we face the period we do now and have so many questions. So we appreciate you. Uh, my pleasure, Maggie. Have a great and day. And thanks to all of you. The Daily Briefing is back tomorrow with Greg Weldon. And as I mentioned earlier, Ralph kicks off the new two-part series. Here's a little preview of what you can expect. If we want to change the outcomes for this really screwed up world, where our wages don't go up, where we're being replaced by technology, where governments are massively in debt and we foot the bill via taxes, where we see debasement of assets so we can't afford as many assets as we like. So the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. If we don't like to see the rise of populism based on this broken society because the promises of the future have been broken, let's make our promises to our future selves come right. And that's by unfucking your future. Some of this is going to really f your future in 20 or 30 years time, but we've got time to figure that out because it's unstoppable. Mm -hmm.